Hey everybody, thank you for joining us today on The Metal Magdalene, and we have a guest with us. We have Dave Greger of the legendary death metal outfit Morta Scold. Welcome back to the show, Dave. Woohoo! Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. So Dave, how long has Morta Scold been around anyways? Well, the band's been around, well, the band started in 1989, and the band broke up in 1998, and then the band got back together in 2011 <laughs> and is current. So, but the band was, you know, even though the band wasn't doing anything, there was still, you know, we were, I was still always releasing stuff. So, I mean, it really depends how you look at it. I mean, I, I look at it, I mean, in me, myself, I've been in the business 32 years. There you go. Uh, and of course, Dying Remains, what, turned 30 years old last Ooh -wee. year. we <laughs> So... I know, I know. It's oh, trust me, it's tripping me out. I'm like, wow, I'm that old, huh? <laughs> and so, so you guys, the band was formed in Milwaukee, home of the Milwaukee Metal Fest. So, did you go to a lot of those fests growing up? Um, you know, honestly, we played most of them. I wouldn't say <laughs> all of them, but I think we started in 1990 or 91, and we played. We pretty much played every year until the band. I think we even played another one in like 2001. I think it mm -hmm. was so. Yeah, we played a good, like, seven or eight of them. So, for me, uh, you know, we were always a staple of the Milwaukee Metal Fest, and Jack Koshik, uh was our manager for many years. So, uh, you know, he would just call me up and, like, hey, we, we're going to put you on. And, you know, I'll never forget the first year we were on. Uh, we went on at 9.30 a.m., and you got 15 minutes. So, I think we played, like, two and a half songs, you know. And uh, so that was kind of... That was kind of a, a little weird at first, you know, and then as we played more of them, we, you know, got better time slots. So you're like the house band of the Milwaukee Fest there? <laughs> yeah, and the, and the Rave, the Rave Eagles Club, uh, because he booked a lot of shows there. So that really was pivotal for us in our career, too, because every time he would bring Morbid Angel or Cannibal Corpse or Obituary or Emily, anybody, anybody, it would be like, hey, you want the gig? And we're like, hell yeah, you know, so... <laughs> We kind of were the house band there for many years. So, so what was it like, you know, playing these fests in your hometown? I mean, now when we look back on that, you know, those times, those were like, you know, legendary fests. We can use the word legendary if it's over 20 sure. years old. <laughs> so, I mean, when, you know, at the time, what was it like playing for your hometown, you know, crowds? And now looking back of it. As this is like all legendary shit. I mean, what was that all like for you guys? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, you know, the the thing that that was that I remember the most is just literally, what hotel is everybody staying? You know, and then the night before the fest, just going to the hotel, jumping from room to room. You know, one room had Cannibal hanging out with Alex and those guys. Next room was Phil and the guys from Malevolent. Then Kelly and the guys from Atheist. Uh, you know, just just jumping from room to room and just, I mean, yeah, I mean, now obviously a lot of these bands are bigger. I don't, you know, I stay in contact with some of them, some of them not so much because obviously they have probably a million emails or a million instant messages. Uh, but I mean, we, I was, we were truly really good friends with all these bands uh, back in the early nineties. Um, we supported, you know, Cannibal a bunch of times and Malevolent, Obituary, Autopsy, uh, Carcass. I mean, entombed i mean if a band came through wisconsin to you know the rave eagles club we usually played it so um you know it was definitely uh an honor for us to play with all these bands but also that's what helped us gain our following too you know uh, when you play in front of so many people but i just remember hopping from room to room and you know a beer here a beer there maybe a little toke here there you know and <laughs> just just hanging out with these guys and just shooting the, the shit about just anything and a lot of it wasn't even about music. It was just about what they're doing or what we're doing. And, you know, it was just some really, really good times. And, yeah, those those times, you know, back in the late 90s and stuff were, like, busting with great death metal. And like you said, you got to meet a lot of people. Was there, But there was there anybody that you met, Dave, that kind of made a big impression on you or, or that you were kind of starstruck by? Ooh, that's wow, that's a good one. <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't, you know, the thing is, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head because I used to actually work there as well. So I used to work for the band. So <laughs> right. I used to work house production. So I I worked with a lot of big names. I mean, I've worked for John Mayer before, Bruce Springsteen, 
uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of Creed. I mean, I've worked for a lot of big bands, so I was never really starstruck. Um, the only person I think that I was really, I think, uh, in, in, in that I really, really wanted to meet was uh, Eric Rutan. Uh, when in 1998, they were doing a show here, we were supporting them, and we did an in-store with them. And I just remember him, and, and, and I would probably have to say Dave Vincent. Dave Vincent was probably the guy who was like, oh my gosh. And I remember he him sit. I remember sitting on the bus, or he's sitting on his bus, and I knock on the door, and he, he hey, what what we're you doing? You know, deep book, what are you doing? I'm like, hey, how's it going? I would come in, and he's watching the news. And I'm like, why are you watching the news? And he goes, gotta stay current on events, man. And uh, so, so th- I, I'd probably say Dave Vincent, but Eric Rutan definitely a close second. Um, I really, really influenced by his style a lot in the last few years. Now, you're playing all these shows, had four full-length albums under your belt, and then you guys called it quits. And the question you answered a zillion times, and now a zillion and one. <laughs> what led up to all that, Dave? Well, you know, it, man, as we know, as the 90s progressed, you know, a new wave of music came in, grunge came in. A lot of people really took to it. Um, a lot of people were not wanting to play death metal as much. Um, and I feel like that was kind of a, I, and I'm talking about like maybe like 95, 96, 97 ish death metal just kind of like, it just seemed like it wasn't as popular as it was. And with that style of music coming in and I hate to say this, but it kind of crushed a lot of the other styles of music. And, um, our drummer at the time, uh, Kent, he, I didn't know. And I didn't know this. I mean, I, I'm still friends with him. We still talk. Uh, and I just found this out probably within the last like 10 years. He didn't like to travel. He re- he didn't want to tour. And that was something that held us back in the 90s was not touring. We had a few opportunities. Um, he had been going to school at the time. And, you know, we're, you know, no, I don't want to do it. I'm going to school. But I think it was just him just not really wanting to travel. And so we had we got our first opportunity to tour. And. The first show was uh, at the Milwaukee Raves Eagle Club opening for Slayer, or supporting Slayer, and that was, like, amazing. Like, we were like, holy crap. <laughs> like, this is awesome. I mean, and we had played Metal Fest in the Eagles uh, ballroom before and played in front of, you know, a couple thousand people. But, you know, when you're supporting Slayer or you're opening for Slayer, it's a whole new ball game. Um, and I remember their tour manager being like, look, look, guys, you got 25 minutes or you got 25 minutes set. If you can't, you know, I'm giving you 10 minutes to set up. If you can't set up at that time, too bad. We're cutting, you know, set time. And we were like, oh, God, you know. (laughs) And we were lucky enough to set up early. And he's like, oh, two minutes. So we're giving you another two minutes, you know. So it was it was one of those experiences. And the next day we were we were were taken off to Florida and we were supposed to support. uh, I think it was Master in Florida. Little, little tiny little club uh, in Fort Walton Beach. And uh as we got closer to Florida, uh, our drummer just wasn't feeling good. Wasn't feeling good. It was just like he kind of was just, I don't, we don't know what it was. And so by the time we get there, we set up all our equipment. We do kind of a quick line check. You know, this is early in the day. And it just seemed as the day progressed, he was getting sicker and sicker. And um, we, we finally said, okay, forget it. We're taking him to the hospital. We took him to the hospital. They said he was severely dehydrated. Uh, you know, they, they pumped him with some, some bags of what, saline or whatever that is to hydrate you. And we're like, okay, let's go back, you know. And we went back, and he was like, no, I just, you know, I just want to go home. So, uh, also, he was just newly married. They were having their first child uh. that day. So, I don't know if that was, you know, I don't know if it was like a psychosomatic thing or if it was really sick. But, unfortunately, we had to call the tour, which was our first tour. And as soon as we got home, I mean, we lost everything. You know, we were on pavement music at the time. They were like, forget you guys. Uh, our Jack Koshik wasn't happy with us. Uh, and we literally, we literally lost everyone. Uh, and we continued to, to play with him uh, for several months. And I think we did a immolation show uh, at a place called Jackhammers in Illinois. And then we did another show, I think, possibly here with him. And we were, we were even writing some newer material. And then he just kind of came up to us one day. I was like, hey, I just... I got to do the family thing. I really don't want to do the band thing anymore. And we're like, oh, okay. You know, so at that point we were on the search for a drummer and we tried out like, I I felt like a thousand guys, but (laughs) it it was like maybe five or six guys and just nobody could play the material. 
So at that point, I I wish I look back in hindsight, and I wish I would have just wait. I just wish I would have, you know, waited it out. I really wish I would have. Uh, but unfortunately, I was like, forget it. Let's call it a day. And then I went on to form another original band that was a little bit more radio friendly, uh, kind of like a watered down Fear Factory meets Static X kind of type thing. Uh, and then that ran its course. And then you know. Um, here I am today. So, not a lot of bands could say that they opened up for Slayer. No, and we had always got, and we were told by a lot of people, "Oh, you're, you're going to get food. You're, <clears throat> you're going to get things thrown at you." And I mean, all this stuff, and we were like petrified. <laughs> and because we have, we have heard that a lot. Like I said, from from other, you know, other bands, like, "Oh man, it's rough opening for them." But we opened for them. We did well. We seemed to be received well. The tour manager gave us a little pat on the back. And, you know, so, I mean, it, it, was, it was definitely a memorable experience. So there you guys are gone for a good long time. But then, Dave, he came back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so tell us about what led to that decision. Did you just get that spark again? Or what was going on there? Well, the... The band that I had formed after Mortis Gold kind of just ran its course. And same thing, you know. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say same thing. I was going through a custody battle trying to fight for my kid. And I ended up losing. Uh, but I, I just wasn't able to, to commit to that. You know, they a couple of the guys just you know, wanted to tour and tour and tour. And I was like, well, we're not getting any offers. But I just told you know, I wasn't able to at that point. So they kind of all went their own way. They did a Fleetwood Mac on me, and they went their own way. And I was like, okay, cool. And then uh, Eric Reif, uh, which produced our first two demos, uh, was asking if uh, I would go in the studio and transfer these uh, demos on the CD for him. And that's kind of really where it all started. And I went in, I did that, and uh, he was working with Relapse at the time because, you know, he used to manage death, and mm -hmm. he also managed obituary. And uh, he was doing all the death relapse uh, reissues. And I don't know if it was me or him, but one of I don't know, it was one of us. I was like, hey, why don't we see if they'll they'll throw this out as, you know, like a comp. You know, we'll put out the first two demos, a couple extra tracks. Let's just do a comp, see what happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was like, okay, sure. So we got relapsed to, uh, you know, license it. And then uh, we did uh, some promotion behind it through Clawhammer PR. And uh, the response just kind of was pr pretty, pretty decent. And then uh, Eric was um, really hounding me, like hounding me, like every week. Dude, get the band back together. I'm like, I don't know if I can play Death Metal anymore. I've been gone for so long. I don't know if I still have it in me. Oh, it's, you know, just come on, do it, do it. And he just kind of really kept pushing me. And uh, at that point, I contacted the, uh, the lineup, a couple guys from Gory Departure and a couple guys from Prolong the Agony. And I just said, hey, man, you know, would you guys be interested in doing any type of reunion stuff? And they were like, yeah, yeah, let, let's do it. You know, so we did, uh, I think, four or five, six shows, um, had really good response. And then at that point, I know uh, the, the Jason Hellman was the he was the original bass player that started the band with me. And him and I wanted to start writing. And uh, Jeff was like, yeah, I, you know, Jeff had gone through some health problems and you know, had some stamina issues and uh, just he just wasn't into writing. And so uh, two of the guys just kind of bowed out. And then uh, Jason and I were just on the look for a drummer at this point. And I was like, you know what? I'm not quitting this time. I don't care if it takes us 10 years to find a drummer. I'm not quitting. We're going to find somebody. And we had been talking on and off with Eric House. Uh, he used to drum for Jungle Rot. And uh, we just, the stars, like, at first didn't line up, and then, boom, one day he called us, and we're like, hey, let's get together at TGI Fridays over a couple beers, let's talk some stuff, and uh, he he became a member, like, the next day, so uh, that kind of, you know, uh, started the spark, so to speak, to write new material and, and kind of test the waters and see if there was any interest. And after being gone for that long and then coming back and you said you played a couple of shows or whatever, what, you know, what was that like for you? And I mean, was it just like picking up where you left off or did it, was it, did it feel different or were the crowds any different? Uh, you know, the, the crowds were, you know, yeah, they were different because, you know, a lot of people throughout the years that we had 
or that where fans grow up, you know, they grow up and they have families or, you know, married, divorced, uh, yeah, you know, some die, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we, the fan base, it, it still was kind of like half and half, but we, we noticed we were playing in front of a lot of newer, newer fans or just people that really hadn't heard us before. So the experience for me was like really just reconnecting with the demos and cause that's pretty much what we were predominantly playing at that time. And I hadn't played any of that demo stuff, you know, since like 90, 91. So it was, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of weird relearning it. And then of course we changed our tuning. So we had a different tuning back in the day. We changed tunings. And so we had to kind of transpose everything into this new tuning. So unfortunately the muscle memory uh, wasn't there because, you know, it was a different tuning. Mm -hmm. Your, your hands are on different, you know, fret markers and, you know, just different positions. Um, but I remember snapping into the, the demos pretty quick. Um, and at one point just going like, you know what, I'd really like to start playing, you know, Dying Remains material. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I really missed that stuff. And then eventually we moved on from the demo material and started playing that material and it just kind of was like, oh, wow. Like, it, at some points, it really was just like stepping back into, you know, an old pair of shoes. It really wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. Um, but there were some adjustments with, you know, writing solos because it, I, I used to have a, a Floyd Rose or a Whammy Bar that's known to most people. And unfortunately, I don't have that anymore. So I had to really go, okay, I'm Whammy here. Well, what do I do now? <laughs> so a little bit of creativity uh, with uh, some of the solos that I had uh done i had to recreate um but other than that no i it just it, it felt comfortable and you know i i, I really was like wow i'm like i, I wish i never would have stopped playing this uh you know back in the day well you know when you left and then you came back and like you said you were playing to these newer crowds who weren't quite as familiar with the band but that's a good thing because then we get this social media bigger than it ever was before and now you know you could get the band out on social media and then people will see holy shit Mortis Skull are back now too so you're getting all those fans back that's one of the few good things about the social media so you're getting all those fans back plus you got all these new people so I guess it wasn't too too bad coming back and you no. know play it. <laughs> no, no, I don't think it, no, I don't think it was a bad thing at all. No. I mean, it's definitely a blessing to yeah. be uh, to to you know I'm 57, uh, so I mean it's definitely a blessing to be at this age and be able to you know still play this style of music. Um, you know, and, which I should have been doing when I was 20. You know, um, you know, like because we like I said we didn't really tour a lot back in the day. And now that we've been back, it's like we've been doing some small tours and this and that. And uh, so, yeah, it's definitely a blessing. And I really enjoy connecting with the fans, especially the fans that have never seen us before. They just stumbled onto us and they're like, oh, my God. Like I had a podcast the other day with a gentleman and he was like, I, I, I just stumbled onto you like 10 years ago. And, and you know, <laughs> and I'm just like, wow, like this is just cool. it just blows my mind when I hear like a. 20 something or a 30 year old mm. go like oh my gosh like i just picked up your album and like didn't even know you guys existed until like <laughs> last week or something and then i just want to mention too that your label actually signed you back on too so that must have made you happy yeah that was honestly that was my doing though yeah. I, I had been i had been begging them well i my other project i was begging them to pick up Mm -hmm. And I look back now and I go, wow, like it's no one because I was really mad at them. I was like, come <laughs> on, you guys, knock it off. Let's do this. And they were like, no, no. <laughs> and I look back now and I go, well, yeah, if it wasn't death metal, that's what their label, you know, signs and produces. Um, and so I had been in touch with the label, like I said, for probably God, many years, even before we came back. And uh, when we started to come back, that's when I started contacting them. And I was like, hey. I was like, you know, I actually started the relationship back with them with asking them if they would re-release or reissue Dying Remains. Ah. Because over the years that we weren't active, I had, you know, several, I, you know, every couple of weeks or every week I'd have a couple guys and another couple of guys. And, hey, when are you going to reissue Dying Remains? Um, you know, the original copies go for, you know, $200 or whatever it is on eBay. And I just said to the label, I said, you know, would you guys mind reissuing this so our fans can get this at an affordable cost instead of having to, 
you know, drain their savings to get one record that they want. So that's where the relationship really started again was the reissue of Dying Remains. And then from there, it just, you know, they were like, hey, let's, you know, I, you know, hey, I said, we got a record. Let's do this. And then it just kind of went from there. And I just want to mention that Mortis Gold is with Peaceville Records still. So, Dave, in 2020, right, you guys released Suffer for Nothing during all the pandemic chaos. Now, was this, you know, planned prior to the pandemic? And why did you release it during this time, knowing there would be, like, no touring or any of that fun stuff? Yes. Yeah, it was all... We, the, I mean, but, you know, obviously once the album was released, I mean, we had recorded it several months. Um, and that's usually the case with a lot of bands. Like, um, you know, our newest record, it's been done since June right. of last yeah, year. Yeah. So sometimes um, sometimes with record labels, they have release dates. And we're lucky enough that with Peaceville, we're able to pick and choose when we want to release stuff. Um, so with Suffer for Nothing, though, it was a little different. We had already signed the contract. They already had a release date for it. Uh, everything, yeah, and everything was, you know, prior to, you know, to the, you know, dark times, I call them. Uh, <laughs> it, it was prior to that. Yeah, we did not see any of that coming. Uh, when, when that record came out, we were, like, kind of devastated because we weren't, you know, our, our, uh, our, our uh, publicist was like, Man, we're throwing this out to everybody, but nobody, nobody's, nobody's around. Nobody's around. Everybody's either working from home or out of jobs. Mm -hmm. So that record really didn't get the press that I feel it deserved. Um, so I, I feel like it kind of went under the radar a little bit because of the pandemic and the things that happened to everybody. Um, you know, we, I mean, even, I even remember going in the studio and our studio guy going like, Hey, don't tell anybody you're here. You know, we couldn't post mm -hmm. pictures. Mm -hmm. We couldn't do any press for it because, you know, certain, certain states were locked down and you had to have like a travel permit and stuff like that. So we were lucky that didn't get too bad here in Wisconsin, but he just didn't, you know, he didn't want to take a chance on somebody online being a keyboard warrior going, Ooh, look, these guys are in the studio. Let's right. shut them down. You know? So we kind of just kept it really tight lipped and uh, we went in, we did our job and recorded it. Uh, we were happy with everything we did. And then when it got released, it was like, Oh man, like really? So yeah, it, it was definitely, it was definitely, I, I was disappointed with, with that, with the, it, I don't feel like it got a proper list. No. And, and it came out like six months right after this whole pandemic, dark times hit, hit <laughs> everything. And it was a terrible time because nobody knew what they were doing. Nobody knew, I mean, in the whole country, um, no. what should be closed, what should be banned, what should be locked down. Yeah. Right when you guys, so of course nobody's going to notice the new album when they're trying to figure out if they're going to be locked down or if whatever's going to go on. But, um, well, sometimes shit's just out of our control, I guess, but it's a shame because it's a good album, you know? Thank you. Yeah, I, I know. And I, and I completely agree with you. I mean, when we, you know, like we go on the road and we have copies or people are like, oh, 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 man, I, did, I didn't get to buy this or, you know, and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say during that particular time record sales were awful no, no. because because people were stuck at home. So, yes, absolutely. You know, yep. people were ordering more stuff online. I mean, Dying Remains sold really well during that period. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, I mean, it wasn't all bad, but yeah, it, it, it was really a disappointment because, you know, you you got a new release. You want to go on the road. You right, want to support it, right. and then you're like, I can't, I can't do anything. I can't. And then by the time you go to support it, it's like old already. So right. yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Well, here we are, and you're about to release Creation Undone out February 23rd on Peaceful yeah. Records. Yeah. So now you said, and I quote, "We worked harder than ever on this record and took a <laughs> different approach writing and recording it." So tell us, so tell us a little bit about this new approach you took, Dave. Right. Well, you know, I, like I said, I don't know how other bands do it. Um, I just know that we've kind of followed a. a you know, we've, we've done, you know, similar stuff in the past. Uh, so, you know, you, you come to practice, you write a song, uh, you know, you, 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 you come back the next week, you rehearse that song, then you write another song, you come back, you rehearse those two songs, and then you, you try to write another song. And I noticed, especially during the Suffer for Nothing uh, writing process, it seemed like 
it just seemed like we were having a really hard time uh, with the momentum of the songs. And it just seemed like they were taking like two months to write a song. And I mean, you know, we're, we're all seasoned players now. We're all older. So we're not, you know, it, it wasn't like it was back in the day where we practiced four days a week. Uh, two of my guys live an hour and a half away. So, you know, we get together once a week and we try to make it very productive. So what, what really happened was Scott came to practice on the wrong day. And Eric calls me and goes, Hey, Scott's here. He got the wrong day. Can, can you come to, you know, can you come down to practice? And I was like, no, I got stuff going on. I can't. So him and Eric had started, uh, they, they, they started writing what became painful conflict on the record. And they started, I think they got like, maybe like, I don't know, a minute and a half, two minutes into the song. So the next week when we came to rehearsal, um, you know, instead of running through stuff or, you know, running through old songs or any of that stuff, we just started right on that song and we just dove right into it. And we noticed that by diving into that song and doing it song by song, we had more energy. We had more energy. We had more ideas. We had more momentum. So when we were done with a song, we put it on the shelf. We didn't look back at it. We continued on to the next song. So it was almost like, Every couple of weeks, we were our, we were writing a new song, and the songs were the writing process wasn't taking as long because you know we we didn't run through a half a set, we didn't run through anything else, so we were fresh. So you know what I mean. So when you're running through five or six songs and mm -hmm. you try to write a song, mm -hmm. well, your energy isn't really there. So we decided just to start every rehearsal fresh. Um, if, if we didn't like it, I mean, we scrapped a couple of songs because we didn't like where they were going. Um, but for the most part, the writing process was just fresh, organic, and just on the spot every, every time. I can't tell you how many riffs on this new record were really an accident. Uh, you know, I just start playing something to warm up, and Kyle would be like, that's it. That's the riff. I like that. Let's, <laughs> let's work on that. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? It's just, it's just, I'm just, I'm just noodling. No, no, no. That's it. That's it. You know? <clears throat> and then the week later, He'd be like, oh, I'm running like 15, 20 minutes late. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, what gives? He's like, oh, I just I just wrote a riff before, and I want to bring it to practice. So there was a lot of that going on. Like, I just wrote a riff like 10 minutes ago, but I'm on my way, you know? Um, and so it was, it was really, uh, a lot of it was really spontaneous. And I think that's, you know, that was the big difference between the way we used to write and the, the way we wrote this record. It was just, I, I, think, I feel like I said it was just more organic. It was more on the spot. And, you know, there was no, like, mulling stuff over, um, you know, oh, hey, uh, you know, let, let, let's check this out. Or, oh, I, I, there's too many notes here or whatever. It was just real spontaneous and just real, just kind of off the cuff a lot of it. And just briefly, tell us a little bit what this album is about lyrically. Well, it's, you know, first of all, I write, I write lyrics of what, I'm, what I feel, what I'm going through. Or what I experience. It could be, it could be anything. And with us going through the pandemic, I was like, man, I mean, I lost two jobs over it. Uh, you know, and then you had the whole people fighting between one another about you should get vaccinated. Well, you shouldn't. Or you should, you know, you had all that controversy and fighting going on. And I just, I mean, you know, there, it's, it's no secret that we're divided. We were divided. It divided us. There's no secret about it. And I just kind of really felt like, man, God gave us this awesome creation. And we're just like fucking it all up, you know, and we're and, and we're killing people. We're killing people Like people are dying. And it was like I just kind of felt like like it was just everything was being undone. And I just felt like everything was just being unraveled. And, you know, kind of like you said, nobody knew where they were going. Like what was shut down? What was open? What's acceptable? What's not? Like everybody just kind of was like thrown into this fire. And I just kind of feel like I just felt like our world was just kind of being torn apart little by little, piece by piece. And the lyrics just kind of reflected all of that, especially with being in these dark times and going, uh oh, I, I, now, now I don't have a job. Now what am I going to do? You know, and then of course, you know, like we were saying, many people weren't hiring, people were laying off, firing, whatever have you. So my mind just really went into a really bad depression 
I mean, there were several days where I just didn't even want to come off the couch, you know? Mm. And uh, I think with us having the music uh, was the therapy. And I just threw all of my thoughts and, and anger and angst and animosity and whatever, sadness, joy. I just threw everything into these lyrics and was like, this this is really in the, the forefront and this is what I want to write. Well, Dave, now put your best salesman voice on and tell us what formats the album is available on and where people can pick up a copy, which looks like it's everywhere. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, even Best Buy. I just noticed <laughs> that the other day. I went to Best Buy. I'm like, wow, it's available at Best Buy. So, I mean, <laughs> I it's, available, it's available at peaceville.com. It's available at Burning Shed. It's on Spotify. Um, there is a band camp out there uh, for just for this record that you can get it at. I don't know the address, but I mean, most people, you have a Google search, you just type Mortal Skull, Creation Undone. It'll pull up all the outlets. I mean, it's on Deez, was that Deez, Diesel or Deezer, whatever mm -hmm. that's called. Yep. Uh, all, all the different formats. And then, like I said, if people want to pre-order it, it's available through peaceville.com or The Burning Shed. And now you guys got a show coming up March 10th in Vegas. But if people want to learn more about the band, where you're going to be playing and all that kind of stuff, where's the best places to find you? What links? Um, the... Uh, our Mortis Skull Facebook page uh, or the or the Mortis Skull Instagram page. Um, and, yeah, we're doing four shows with Skeletal Remains. Three are going to be in California. And then the last one will be in Vegas. And then two weeks after that, we are headed to South America with Malevolent Creation. Wow. For a couple of days. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really excited about that because I really didn't realize uh, that we had a lot of fans in South America. But they been getting a lot of emails and messages. So, we're, we're really, really looking forward to uh, to these these next two runs. Creation Undone, out February 23rd on Peaceville Records. And Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show and telling us about what's going on with the band and the new release, and we wish you all the best. I thank you so much, Jeff, for your support. I know you have a lot of loyal followers. We we all follow you, and I tell you, I love your food pictures. <laughs> um, I, was, I was just telling my fiancé, like, man... If she was closer, I would have her make our cupcakes for our wedding because the stuff you make, I, oh my God. And my, and my fiance is a really good baker as well. So I share your pictures with her and it's like, we can almost taste it through the, through the Christmas book, you know, so. Well, thank you so much, you guys. You have a nice night. You got it. Take care.